So if you're listening to this podcast, I think that makes you a curious person. I am a curious person. That is, in fact, pretty much the reason why I do whatever I do. I want to know stuff. And that's why I am a big fan of The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus offers you unlimited access to award-winning experts about anything. There's stuff about hobbies, which is great, although I, my hobby is reading stuff, so I'm more interested in history, politics, science. You can also do cooking and photography and languages. There's over 8,500 lectures to watch, and you can watch on your smartphone, your tablet, your laptop, or your TV. I have it on my Roku at home. Um, and also, you can listen uh, as you do whatever it is you do while you're doing podcasts. And right now, as one of my listeners, you can enjoy The Great Courses Plus for free. I have been listening to and watching, but honestly more listening to, Behavioral Economics When Psychology and Economics Collide. It's a fascinating uh, course on why people do the things they do, the things that seem crazy to us, the things that don't make sense. The first class was an explanation of so-called rational choice theory that actually basically explained that rational in economics doesn't mean rational like Spock. Uh, rational in economics, all that means is like consistent more than anything else, which helped me just understand a lot of what I thought I already knew um, about economics. It offers insight into the positive and negative effects of our personal biases on the choices that we make. The Great Courses Plus is lifelong learning at its best. And I want you to experience The Great Courses Plus too. They are giving you, my listeners, an entire month of unlimited access, unlimited access to their lectures on anything. But you need to sign up through my special URL. And that is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash friends. So there's a the in there and a plus in there that you might forget. It's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash friends. Start your free month now. TheGreatCoursesPlus.com slash friends. Hi, I'm Anna Marie Cox. Welcome to With Friends Like These. Um, we have a show about the end of the world today uh, and the end of the Republican Party, but I think you'll find it um, less dark than you might think. There's hope around the corner as well. First off, to talk about evangelicals and Trump and the complex theological reasons why they support his move to proclaim Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, is Diana Butler Bass. She is an author of nine books on American religion, including Christianity After Religion, Christianity for the Rest of Us, and A People's History of Christianity. Also on the show today is a friend of the pod, Rick Wilson, Republican provocateur uh, and stalwart never Trumper. He will check in with us about the state of the conservative movement in America, which I'll give you a little spoiler. Not good. It is, it is not good. So Diana Butler Bass, Rick Wilson, stay tuned. Diana Butler Bass, welcome to With Friends Like These. Oh, it's good to be here. So I've been excited to have you on the show for a long time, and I, I seized upon the following excuse to have you on, which is that uh, on Twitter, you called attention to the fact that Trump proclaiming uh, the capital of Israel to be Jerusalem, like, isn't just like some generic, like, conservative uh, policy point that you have to check off to prove you're a conservative. There's actually like a, a really long history to why uh, evangelicals in particular want this. And it's not, it's not just because they like Jews. In fact, you might argue that it's, it's the opposite. So do you want to like lay out the, what what's going on here for people who may not know the theology behind this? Yeah, it's a it's a very strange sort of theological vision that conservative evangelicals, sometimes we refer to them as fun, fundamentalists, um, have about Jerusalem and the Bible. And I, I know this because I actually grew up when I was a teenager in Arizona in a church uh, that taught this kind of theology that's very widely spread um, among uh, conservative evangelical churches. It's called dispensational premillennialism, which is a mouthful. Uh, but what that theological vision says is that Jews must be returned to Israel, 
in order that biblical prophecy about the end times will unfold. And so it's an absolute necessity that Jerusalem be under control of Jews in order for these sort of biblical events to happen that will lead to the return of Jesus and the final judgment and the coming the coming of the kingdom. And so when I actually heard Trump start talking about Jerusalem, I thought my first thought was, "Oh my gosh, he's doing this to speak to his evangelical base." And I wouldn't be surprised if people like Robert Jeffress and Paula White who are on his evangelical advisory team had encouraged him to come out with this position now in order to strengthen his his numbers, which have been falling pretty badly through the month, and to remind evangelicals that he, Trump, is actually an agent of God who is working out biblical prophecy. And we can go into the the depths and the complexities of dispensational premillennialism as you like, uh, but uh, it is really... I would say that it is the most dominant sort of form of American popular religion in how conservative Christians think about the end of the world. And Israel plays a really important role in it. And I think what this does is give some depth to the idea that evangelicals are supporting Trump just as an instrument of God. Like, So I think the, the thing you hear a lot about is... Gorsuch, right? Like, that's why evangelicals support Trump, is that he appointed a uh, conservative to the Supreme Court. Um, but there is, like, a sort of even larger framework. In fact, it's a framework that encompasses the known universe, <laughs> because they genuinely believe, especially with this move, that Donald Trump himself can help bring on Armageddon. That's correct. Although I doubt that in most evangelical churches, people are sort of cheering that there could be bloodshed and uh, this huge war in in the Middle East. That's not generally the way it works in evangelical churches. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they will be thinking about is th- the way that this this doctrine works for them is that a certain number of events will happen that set up the last days, that set up this great bloody end of history battle that we call the War of Armageddon. Um, But part of what's going to occur in that set of events is that Christians will be taken up into heaven and sort of rescued from this moment of bloody history uh, by Jesus in an event called the rapture. And so Christians who would be proclaiming this idea or Christians who believe in this idea, they don't emphasize the war part. They emphasize Mm -hmm. the rapture part, that Jesus is going to come and rescue them and that they're going to be with Jesus in heaven while for seven years, all the rest of us um, are here in this sort of theater of violence and despair. And that it's in those seven years, this, this time that they refer to as the tribulation, that they believe that Jews will finally convert to becoming Christians and that the Jews will then proclaim the gospel of Jesus and that they're going to finally have this sort of faithful response um, to God's offer of the Messiah. And once the Jews all convert and these sort of bloody events take place, then Christians will return with Jesus from from heaven where they've been waiting it out with 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 their buddy and then the judgment will happen and everyone who has not responded in any way that they're born again or that they love god all those people are going to go to hell and then the christians and the converted jews and anybody else who's been converted during the terrible time of the tribulation will all go into god's kingdom of heaven and and righteousness, and it will last for a thousand perfect, beautiful years. And so the whole reason why 
evangelicals have this sort of passion for Judaism is because they feel like the Jews haven't yet converted to Jesus <laughs> and that they have to have that chance to do that before the end times unfold. And so so I look at that and I think to myself, that doesn't actually seem to me that it's a sort of really a deep appreciation for Judaism that's hmm. happening there. Um, but rather, Jews are an instrument to accomplish the end of the world. Yeah. There's a part of me that feels like I, I wanted to have you on to talk about this. I want to kind of get people to pay attention to it because although the evangelical Christians themselves, conservative evangelical Christians themselves don't emphasize the Armageddon part, like you said, there is something like just, it should alarm Mm -hmm. people (laughs) that there's a very strong constituency around Donald Trump that is trying to bring on the end of the world. I mean, there's a lot that's been written about this, and you're one of the people yeah. that's written about it. But this perspective explains a lot about con- how conservative Christians can have policy viewpoints that don't seem super Christian, like to me, a Christian, right? Like uh, they're not particularly interested in climate change, for instance, uh, because, hey, world's going to end. <laughs> that's right. The world's going to end soon. And so why why bother? And um, there was... a. Uh, I said when I was a when I was a teenager in the 1970s, I lived in Arizona and I was part of a church that had these these kind of views. That was a long time ago. It's been a long time since I've had these views myself. Um, But one of the things that changed my mind about this whole theology is when I got into my early 20s and the the nuclear um, arms race was, you know, ramping up. And then the nuclear disarmament move, movement emerged. And I was at an evangelical seminary at the time, and I actually remember um, my classmates having arguments about whether or not it was appropriate for a Christian to become involved in a nuclear disarmament move, movement because wasn't God going to use nuclear arms anyway just to end the world? <sighs> And I I would sit there and I would think, these are people that I like and are sort of sane and they're going to be pastors in churches. And that's like the craziest thing I've ever heard. And so it's it's really strange that people who, you know, worship a God who is the creator of, of all that is are nevertheless so callously sort of in disregard of the future of that creation. And and a lot of it is related to this kind of theology. It's because, hey, you know, in the end, it's all going to burn up anyway, so why not help it along? Or, um, you know, it's just part of God's plan. I feel like it also explains their support for the vulgarian, you know, sinner Trump, right? Like there's something, the very like floridness of his lack of faith somehow fits into this nihilistic viewpoint that the world's going to end anyway. And this this guy who is kind of terrible is going to be the instrument of that. You know, like it's yeah. it, the narrative, I think, just sort of makes intuitive sense to someone who's grown up in that culture. Yeah, it really does seem to do that. Some of the same people who right now are dog whistling about Jerusalem and the conversion of the Jews and biblical prophecy in the Middle East You know, they're also the same people who before the election had equated um, Donald Trump with King David. Mm -hmm. And the idea there, of course, was that King David had a terrible moral life and had all these, you know, had affairs and had all these concubines and all this kind of stuff, but that he winds up being the greatest king of Israel and setting up the line for the coming of the Messiah. And so the the equation of Donald Trump with King David was, first of all, about what you're talking about. Oh, well, you know, yeah, he's had a lot of wives. He's had a lot of, you know, lovers or girlfriends or he has abused women and all these kinds of things. But it really doesn't matter because Donald Trump is setting up this set of historical events that will lead to the return of the Messiah. And so the King David comparison is pretty strong and is very powerful within this worldview. I also feel like we should hasten to add, as both of us um, proclaim ourselves to be Christian, that this stuff about the Armageddon and the rapture isn't actually really very much in the Bible. (laughs) Like, (laughs) that's a real specific and relatively recent reading of that text. Yes, it is. 
Yeah, that was actually, for me, one of the reasons why I went off to graduate school and got a PhD in religious studies. Uh, My expertise area, my academic expertise area, is the history of American fundamentalism. And I actually worked with a fellow by the name of George Marsden, who is probably the most influential thinker and historian of the last 40 years on the subject of the development of fundamentalism. And one of the things that Marsden pointed out very early on in his work, which spans from about 1975, and he's he's now 80, so he's retired. Um, but he talked about how this apocalyptic worldview, dispensational premillennialism, was born in the 1840s. And it was literally a sort of vision of biblical interpretation that was invented from almost whole cloth uh, by a Church of England minister by the name of John Nelson Darby. And uh, Pastor Darby got very frustrated with the Church of England and wound up founding a small denomination in Ireland and and in Britain uh, called uh, the Plymouth Brethren. And the Plymouth Brethren had this This remarkably spelled out sort of view of history, that there were seven distinct um, dispensations of time that the Bible talked about, and Darby went and he, you know, divided the Bible up into these sort of seven portions, and uh, in a very real sense, the 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 whole worldview, the whole theology is anti-Semitic. Because it talks, uh, Darby talks about how one of the earlier dispensations is the dispensation of the law, and that's when God worked primarily through the Jews. And then that dispensation is replaced by a dispensation of grace. And essentially, during the dispensation of grace, which is the time that Darby said we were living in now, and you have to remember again, this is all being written in the 1840s, um, this dispensation of grace, God works only through the church Mm. and not through the Jews, (laughs) but that God still loves the Jews and that sometime in the future, during that seventh and last dispensation, um, God was going to use the Jews again. Uh, to forward God's purpose uh, for the universe. And so what this apocalyptic theology about is about is that one day the age of grace, the age of the church, will come to an end, and then this other thing is going to happen that will take us to the actual end of history. And it's during that last dispensation, the, the rapture, the tribulation, and then the, the mille- what's called the millennium, um, that the Jews will finally fulfill what mm-hmm. God's purpose was for them, and that was to worship and to praise the Messiah forever. And that Messiah, of course, is Jesus. And so there's this sort of deeply sort of anti-Semitic theology, which doesn't like the idea of Jewish theology based around the law, mm-hmm. that thinks that the church is superior, and then says, well, Jews are going to get a second chance, but God has to work through with the church first. And and this theology um, became pretty popular in England, but where it really caught on was the United States. Well, I was just going to say, like, to in order to get this reading of the Bible, you kind of have to cut and paste a new Bible together. Like, it's you have to flip from this page to that page, like literally sort of like in order to get some of the, the so-called, you know, revelations and all the... Per- well, they're basically like predictions, right? Um, the, that lay out the timeline of the rapture and what's going to happen. You can't just, you're, they're not, they always say, fundamentalists always say they're just reading the Bible, right? They're just telling you what's in there. That's correct. But they're not. They're like taking this snippet and that snippet and putting it together and then ignoring this other snippet. It's all pretty, like, it's not really recognizable if you lay them side by side. Yeah, and you know, it really does relate to that because many American fundamentalists think of the Bible as kind of like a history textbook. Mm -hmm. You know, start on page one, and page one tells you about creation, and then it's a sort of a chronological arc that you would, like reading a book by John Meacham, you know, (laughs) (laughs) it's just a chronology of human history through time. And so you have the beginning, you have all the stuff that happens in the middle, and then you have the end. And so um, fundamentalists, when they looked at scripture in the late 19th century, 
they looked at it like it was a history textbook. And and they thought, well, you know, God worked this way and then God worked this way and then God worked this way and then God worked this way. And it's all building through time and it's going to end up this 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 direction. And what they don't understand, of course, and it, and the traditions, I'm, I'm an Episcopalian now and I have been for 30 years, you know, but the way we read the Bible is that the Bible is a collection of these beautiful ancient wisdom texts, and some of them are poetry, and some of them tell us some things about history, and some are wisdom literature, and others are apocalyptic literature. There's a lot of different kinds of things in the Bible, and it's not a chronological book to be read like you'd read, as I said, sort of like a John Meacham history of Andrew Jackson. Yeah, it's just not the same thing, but fundamentalists in the late 19th century thought it was. And that's where they get this very literal idea. And when they approach the Bible with those sort of 19th century historical lenses on, that's, this is what they thought they found. Uh, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And they got fascinated by the end. HelloFresh is a meal delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers your favorite step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. I have tried other home delivery meal kits. And I will say that HelloFresh is definitely the one that lays it out for you the best. If you think that you don't want to cook at home because you're just too tired after a long day of work, HelloFresh has you. Because once you start, you're kind of already doing it, you're already in it, and you're done pretty much before you know it. They offer a wide variety of chef curated recipes that change weekly. And there are three plans to choose from. Classic, which is a variety of meat, fish, and seasonal produce. Veggie, which is vegetarian recipes with plant-based proteins, grains, and seasonal produce. And then family, which is quick and easy meals with yum-worthy flavor for the whole family. You can choose your delivery day for when it works best for you. You can pause your account for weeks at a time when you're out of town. And all the ingredients come pre-measured in handy labeled meal kits so you know which ingredients go with which recipe. And it's delivered right to your door in recyclable, insulated packaging. You can get $30 off your first week of HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com and entering with Friends 30. That's $30 off your first week with with Friends 30. They make it so easy to cook delicious and balanced dinners for less than $10 a meal. Again, compare this to eating out or ordering in, and it's a bargain, and it is so much better for you. Also, it's something you can do uh, you know, couple time. That is something that my husband and I do. We, one of us cooks and the other one sits at the counter and the meals come together in such a way, like you're not like totally having to like focus constantly on what you're doing. It's actually a great time to just catch up. So no more time consuming meal planning or grocery shopping. Enjoy not having to plan dinner, spend money on takeout for an easy night or worry about gathering ingredients week after week. Get $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. Visit HelloFresh.com and enter with Friends 30. Do you think that progressive sort of general lack of familiarity with Christianity um, as a definitely sort of as a policy engine weakens their ability to make arguments? or to debate about these things? Because I kind of feel like this, like, for instance, about the proclaiming Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, like, there is an argument to say that if you didn't want to do this, there's, there's of course, the, the, the way it upsets our, the peace process, which is bad, right? But there's also, like, you're doing this for this crazy reason that is, that is ultimately about wanting to, you know, destroy the world. But, you know, progressives... I think just genuinely don't know that. Do you think, and and that reminds me of sort of the larger point, do you think that progressives who aren't familiar with Christianity um, are, it's a weakness to their ability to debate in the public square? Yeah, I I think it is a weakness. You know, for one thing, a lot of progressives will hear this kind of stuff and they'll say, oh, well, that's just insane. You know, but the truth of it is, is there are millions and millions of Americans who actually have this as a really important framing device in the way that they interpret and understand the world and history. And so, you know, you might not think it's particularly sane, but the truth of it is, is there are lots of people who organize their lives this way. And I was sort of fascinated when I saw the statements that came out by many of the people who were on Trump's Evangelical Advisory Committee, several of them specifically appealed to uh, 
the centrality of Jerusalem and biblical prophecy. Mm-hmm. Robert Jeffress said that outright. He said he couldn't be happier about what Trump did because obviously Jerusalem is the the beloved capital, beloved city of God from the Bible, and it is at the center of biblical prophecy. And if you're sitting at the New York Times and you don't know what Jeffress is talking about, you just think, oh, well, he's some yokel from, you know, Texas, and and this is goofy. Um, but the truth of it is, is that there are people who are waiting for this to happen, people who want these events to unfold, because finally what's going to occur is the the sort of ultimate in religious liberty, quote unquote, and that is the righteous will get their reward and the evildoers will all be punished. Mm-hmm. And so there's this really powerful emotional connected connectedness to this narrative in um, evangelical circles, especially when evangelicals are feeling persecuted. And if you don't know that, that you can't read the what's going on very well. Right. And I think a lot of people who are you know secular minded um, in the in the in my experience in the mainstream media is that most journalists are whether or not they're conservative. It just it, they tend to think with, th- secularly, right? I still do, actually. I mean, I would say that that's sort of the norm for a, a lot of people in this like uh, demographic. I think they shy away from even mentioning religion, except as a, an identifier, because they feel like maybe they'll get it wrong, or maybe it'll sound condescending. But I feel like, for instance, on this Jeffers mm-hmm. point, Reporters all the time talk about, say, Republican tax policy and uh, point out that Republicans have a, th- have a philosophy of tax policy, right? They believe that if you cut, cut taxes for corporations and rich people, it will grow the economy. That is, I would say, almost a theology. It is an argument of faith <laughs> more than it is an actual statistical or economic mm-hmm. argument. But you, I can imagine someone reporting on the evangelical response to Trump's announcement And just saying in print, this is why, you know, this is important. Like in the same way that you would say, uh, you know, Grover Norquist, who believes that tax cuts uh, will propel the economy forward, said da-da-da-da-da. You could kind of say Robert Jeffers, who believes that uh, the Jews controlling Israel will hasten the end of the world, believes da-da-da-da-da. I mean, it sounds weird, but... I think you I think you can start to contextualize stuff this way and I think it will be helpful to people and doesn't have to be condescending or or not condescending. Yeah. And I I think that it would maybe start to alert people who don't believe this that this is a thing that they have to engage with. Yeah, I think about it in the way that I just explained it to you. You know, I mean there's there's two almost two levels in which my uh, life as a writer um, work. And one is that, you know, I'm a professional. I'm a, I've am been a college professor. I've been a seminary professor. I write about religion. And I know all this analytical stuff and these, these tools. I use these tools, the same tools that secular journalists use and professors in secular universities. But then I also have this personal story. And the personal story is that I was part of one of these communities for a significant early part of of my life. And so I I hear the theological angle of it um, very quickly because that's where I grew up. While my classmates were smoking pot and getting drunk in the football (laughs) field, I was going to Bible study. And so as a professional, the theological language and the theological worldview, uh, it, it always pops for me. I'm always aware of it. And so when I sit down, I try to explain this to students or friends. What I think the best way of explaining something like dispensational premillennialism is not, oh, my gosh, it's nutty, even though it was one of the things that made me decide to walk a different religious path. I couldn't stay in that community anymore. I had to mm-hmm. become a different kind of Christian. Um, it's, it's, it's also it's a philosophy of history. Mm-hmm. And that makes a difference, that the people who are Trump's religious advisors have a philosophy of history. And when they sit in a room with him and they're praying with him or they're advising him on something like the Holy Land, that philosophy of history is front and center for them. Mm -hmm. And they are going to be 
teaching him that and trying to shape the choices he makes around that philosophy of history. And it, for me, it's, it comes down to something that simple. And they'll make room for him in that philosophy, you know, like they'll stick, they'll con- That's right. shape their beliefs about him to fit him into the philosophy. And I have to say that knowing this and when I think about what, how this information, you know, shapes my uh, view of how to proceed in the world, it does wind up suggesting that outreach to base Trump voters, this is yet more reason that they're not really gettable. <laughs> that it is extremely difficult. Yeah, I think I said un- that in the Twitter right. thread where I was writing yeah. about this. <laughs> right. It's really difficult to change a philosophy of history that somebody holds, especially if they think it comes from the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. They're not gettable. And also the kinds of arguments about policy outcomes that that make sense to maybe most people, you know, that have to do with marginal tax rates uh, and even, uh, you know, more mundane things. I don't know what they would be off the top of my head, but, you know, uh, healthcare, uh, which isn't mundane, but uh, it is a policy, you know, thing that seems uh, quotidian, at least. Um, Like saying to a base evangelical voter, Trump is taking away your healthcare is not a good is not an argument that's going to necessarily change their mind because he's part of history and that's bigger than even healthcare. Yeah. And they're contributing. I mean, by supporting him and by praying for him, they're actually contributing to the unfolding of sacred, the sacred intention, the sacred to sacred history. And, um, you know, it's a way that they're, they're doing their part. Mm. And I find it really difficult to know how to talk about that, too, with um, people who are supporting Trump for these sorts of really deep religious reasons. Mm. Well, there are, you know, religious extremists um, is one way of putting it. And there are whole departments of our, you know, Department of Defense that think about how to de, you know, uh, radicalize people. And I think there are methods uh, we just don't think about it, of course, when it applies to, you know, evangelical, conservative, white Americans. I tend to think that where we end up as progressive commentators is just, well, turnout. <laughs> you know, turnout, turnout, turnout. Uh, <laughs> that's that's like the only answer here because these people are not gettable. And, I, you know, I think about Roy Moore um, and what's happening in Alabama. I think definitely there's a strong contingent of of this theology supporting Roy Moore. Um, you hear it, you, I mean, his spokeswoman appears yes. to be one of them. Um, uh, no one, no, those people are not gettable. They're, they're just not. Uh, and they can, because they can hold in their head this idea that Roy Moore might be a child molester. It might, maybe. <laughs> and it just doesn't matter because there's this larger story that they're a part of. Yeah. Because he's doing God's will. Yeah. Okay. But, the, you know, there is one thing that I I have found pretty interesting that I, I would hope gives you hope. And that is uh, when I wrote a, a Twitter thread that a lot of people saw and started talking to me about this uh, stuff about the end of the world and Jerusalem and Trump, I got hundreds of responses and private emails from people who told me that they used to believe this Mm -hmm. stuff, but that they don't anymore. And people told me stories about how it just became increasingly untenable to them, that when they're, for example, say when their kids were born, they realized that life was beautiful and they didn't want to think about the end of the world, but they wanted to think about the beauty of life. Or when they got involved in cleaning up a creek or a watershed in the town where they live, they began to understand environmental issues. And, and those things became so at odds mm. with the philosophy of history and this biblical interpretation that they'd learned that one of the two things had to go. Either they had to let go of a meaningful experience that they'd had of love and life and beauty in this world, or they had to let go of the theology. 
And that that sort of moment where everything fell apart for them was a moment in which they decided that they were going to either leave religion altogether or they were going to find a different religious tradition. So I know that there is within a good number of people in these communities, if they really think about this Mm -hmm. and they think about the, the things that they love the most in their lives, most people are not going to sacrifice their children to some theoretical idea of the War of Armageddon in the Holy Land. Mm-hmm. And so to, the, to help people really embrace and enjoy and love um, the good things of this world, I think is actually a kind of a corrective mm-hmm. to this theology. And it might be enough of a corrective that some people actually have conversion experiences away from uh, this kind of really horrible um, interpretation of the Bible. Well, that's sort of what the idea that this show is built on, the idea that individual conversations are different than political messaging, right? Uh, and individual experiences are the things that can change, you know, individual points of view. Uh, that we may be sort of people doing right. democratic messaging might not think too hard about trying to convert evangelicals as a group, but, you know, uh, we who feel that that is something that's possible can in our individual lives live a truth that might be attractive to someone who is currently an evangelical, right? And we can engage them personally, and do our own kind of evangelism, really. Um, and which I've always, and I argue in the show all the time, the best form of evangelism is attraction, not promotion. The best form of evangelism is to, to live values that, that, and to live a life that makes other people curious about how you do it. So when I hear those stories, that's what I think of. And I think it's pretty powerful. Most of my friends from my teenage years when I was in the the Bible study and the church that taught this stuff, probably about a third of the people I knew at that time still have these views at some level or another, but about two thirds don't. Mm -hmm. And um, the biggest thing we used to talk about when we were teenagers and uh, we would be talking about the end times and whether or not the rapture was coming is that here we would be sitting in a room where we're 14, 15, 16 years old. And um, we, of course, have been told that you're not supposed to have sex until you're married. You know, so purity culture and all of that was so important in that church. And we would literally talk among ourselves saying that we hoped that the rapture wouldn't happen until we were old enough to have sex. <laughs> and so here are these kids. Well, so here, here are these teenagers. And we actually knew that this was a kind of a goofy way, way of thinking about the world because there were things we wanted to, to enjoy in the world. And sex was one of them. And if the rapture came and our parents were like, oh, yeah, oh, please come quickly, Lord Jesus. And we were praying things like, well, maybe you should wait until we graduate from college and can walk down the aisle and get married, you know. (laughs) And we literally would have conversations about whether or not if you knew the rapture was coming tomorrow, if you'd have premarital sex. Wow. And where'd you fall? I was very, very conservative on these things. I was... uh, I waited. I, I waited. <laughs> I actually um, had a period of, of exploring evangelical uh, Christian uh, church as a teenager myself. And it was the premarital sex thing that was a deal breaker, not because I was having it, but because I actually just couldn't get my <laughs> mind around the idea that that would, you would go to hell. That it would be like, right. That that in and of itself was going to send you to this place of, of, because it seemed on a different order than like murdering somebody, right? Like <laughs> that just, I couldn't, I couldn't understand. Like a lot of the <laughs> sins I understood as being bad things and like why you would punish someone, like even greed, right? Um, that's bad. Uh, lust, I can understand that too. But actually, but just two people who are who in love having premarital sex, like really? Like that's, you're going to get the same punishment as everyone else i don't i don't i don't know it just doesn't make sense to me <laughs> well i just i thought it was hilarious you know that we cared that we actually asked that question in yeah, relationship to the rapture oh, of course you know and 
I do remember a youth pastor finding out that we'd asked that question. He said, well, do you realize that it will be such a great honor to come before Jesus and be unstained? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And we wonder why Roy Moore uh, felt like he could do the stuff that he did. I think that we know. Well, it was not a satisfying answer, though, to the 16-year-olds. No, no. I'm I'm, I'm sure it wasn't. So we need to wrap up, but I want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, And I know you have a book coming out that people should keep their eyes open for. What is it called? Uh, Well, the book that's coming out in April 2018 is called Grateful, uh, The Transformative Power of Giving Thanks. And uh, one of the reasons why... I loved writing this book is that I actually wrote the first draft of the book during the first 100 days of Donald Trump being president. And it was a time which I did not want to be grateful that there felt like there was very little uh, for which to give thanks. And it was that sort of collision between uh, the book I was writing and that I was contracted to write mm-hmm. about gratitude and the moment in time that we were all living that really taught me that that gratitude is it it really can change things and that it's a much more powerful spiritual path than even I suspected when I embarked on writing the project. So I I look forward to talking to you about that when we get closer to the time it comes out. I definitely want to have you on. I believe that that is the thing that has saved me, actually. Um, I think perhaps, perhaps obviously like gratitude and grace are, are, are walk hand in hand. So I look forward to having that discussion. Thank you so much, Diana Butler-Bass. Thank you. It's been great to talk theology with you today. (laughs) And speaking of the apocalypse, let's say the zombie apocalypse is here. How are you going to know where all the stuff that you need is? Is the chainsaw under the couch? Um, Is uh, the axe uh, in the closet? Is it too late? You've already been taken. You better get a tracker. Eight years ago, Tracker changed everything. They released their first tracking advice, and now they've done it again with the new Tracker Pixel. That's Tracker with no E, by the way, and Pixel. And you can stick it on anything, and you can use it to find anything. You'll never worry about losing things again. Now, in reality, the zombie apocalypse probably isn't the thing you're going to be worried about, but oftentimes it feels like the kind of pressure we're under when we're leaving the house, right? Like I know for me, um, I tend to run a little bit late for things. So that, you know, frantic kind of padding of pockets, or if you're a lady person who carries a purse or anyone who carries a purse, um, the frantic uh, digging through that, you know, black hole, uh, you don't have to do that with Tracker Pixel. It is the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. You can put it on whatever you tend to lose. Keys, wallets, the purse itself. It's small enough to fit anywhere. And when you misplace an item that has a tracker pixel attached, you just use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. It even has powerful LED lights so you can find anything even in the dark that is especially helpful for those black hole purses that some of us have. Lose your phone? Just press the button on your tracker pixel and your phone rings, even if it's on silent. You can even locate your item if it's miles away because every tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. People are constantly reporting in uh, you know, their location. It's like, I don't know if you use Weather Underground, it's like that or like Waze, but for finding things. And Tracker's 30-day money-back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. I only now just got that joke. So... Tracker makes a great gift, and during the holiday season, save 20% on your order when you go to the Tracker, and that is without the second E, T H E T R A C K R dot com slash friends. That's the Tracker with an E in the the, but not in the Tracker dot com slash friends for 20% off. The Tracker dot com slash friends. So, Rick, hey. Hey, how are you? I am, well, you know, I I am doing okay in Trump-adjusted terms. Uh, And I, you know, I just wanted to catch up with you for kind of monthly check-in on the state of uh, the conservative movement in America. How are things, Rick? Well, right now, the conservative movement has, um, the Republican Party has eliminated the elephant as our symbol, and it's now been replaced with pedo bear. Um, (laughs) We are in a state of... uh, of, of of moral collapse like I've rarely seen or even imagined in this party. Um, you know, we're defending Roy Moore and Blake Farenhold. Um, 
uh, while while the Democrats, for once in their once in their their God blessed pee pick and hearts, they have figured something out strategically to do the 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 painful right thing, um, and not just let tribalism rule the day. Um, because I think what they did today with Franken had the had a, had a, a very interesting long term strategic impact. On the one hand, it was you know very painful and and maybe disproportionate, mm-hmm. but on the other hand, you know that between Conyers and Franken, they took away the sword the Republicans would use to to battle back and say, oh well, what about so and so? What about this guy? What about that guy? Um, so it's really quite a it's really quite a moment. Yeah, I I spoke about my feelings about Franken. Uh, on the Morning Joe show today, where I, I was, saw that. That, yes, where I, I, the panel did not agree with me, <laughs> um, and I'm of the position. I, I, I do think it's possible that his resignation is a disproportionate response. Although I feel like, in this moment, let's figure that out later. And he all, and this sounds. I know people are telling me I'm crazy, but I'm his constituent. I'm willing to vote for him again. I just think at this particular moment to take time and try and get things right and to step down is a sign that you really want to be a part of the movement to change things, you know? And it has the added, but to me, it has the added benefit of being a good strategic move. Like, that's not my first line thinking on it. I grant that maybe my time living outside the Beltway has has perverted me. <laughs> well, remember, I'm a shallow political operative, and I I look at these things in in, a, in the, you know, you still have to look at through the what what's the expedient course, which mm-hmm. would would have been to stay and fight and keep them keep that member of your of your of your caucus number uh, there and scrap and, and try to and try to beat this thing down. But strategically, and, and and I like to say this a lot. I've said this to you before. I think Democrats are holistically pretty terrible at politics mm-hmm. in the big picture stuff. Um, this actually looked to me like they really had their act together in terms of of doing something that was painful, um, but that has a downstream uh, benefit for them as a party. It, it and unfortunately. I'm seeing the exact opposite thing with my party. There are people who are literally saying things to me like, yeah, it's just Alabama. Nobody's going to care. Roy wants another vote in the Senate. We need his vote on judges. And, you know, if he'll vote for a Supreme Court justice, the next one, that's then we're fine. We don't care. Nothing's going to happen. No big deal. You guys predicted Trump would lose, and now you're wrong again because Roy Moore's going to be a hero. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I actually, you know, you're you have been around – the block <laughs> and seen a lot on the hill. Um, I won't ask you to predict the outcome in Alabama because I, I just I think I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know what your professional opinion is. I have I have a I have a weird pr- prediction oh, okay. because no one can model, in my view, either the shy Jones voter or the shy Moore mm-hmm. voter. Mm-hmm. And 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 there's been a. I'm on a couple of Slack channels and, and a couple of email chains with all my pollster friends. Yes, it's as nerdy as it sounds. Um, trying to build a model that figures out what the heck is going on in Alabama. And, you know, you can make an equally compelling case that Doug Jones is going to win by five points or an equally compelling case that uh, Roy Moore is going to win by nine points. And it all really comes down to the, to the question of, you know, how deep um, – how deep is the repulsion among Republican women, uh, you know, and, and how much are they saying, you know, I, I'm not going to vote or I'm going to still vote for Roy Moore and actually going to go vote for Doug Jones. Um, and the flip side of that is how many other people are saying, eh, I'm not going to vote for Roy Moore, but it's in, in their secret heart of hearts are still going to go out and, you know, vote for vote for the pedophile. So it's it's a it's a it's a tough modeling assignment. And, you know, you can look at Alabama as Alabama. And it's the, one of the deepest red states in the country. And there are a lot of people who believe that the earth was 6,000 years old and Jesus rode a dinosaur um, and that Roy Moore, you know, is not gone far enough. So, you know, um, but on the other hand, it's also not the cliche that everybody thinks it is. And there are some there are some affluent, educated suburban folks around Birmingham and Huntsville and and Mobile who, who, who could swing this election. And... You know, the, the big X factor is the one that hasn't been in play in this thing, and that's, you know, the African-American yep. community, which is a very large percentage of the vote in Alabama. And, you know, the question is, has Doug Jones got them motivated enough to come out? And, you know, I mean, I think having guys like Steve Bannon, who's who's a Klansman in everything but the pointy white hat, 
um, campaigning there, you know, doesn't hurt. But I don't know if he's got if Jones has got them motivated enough to make a decisive uh, impact yet. Uh, I will not pretend to even be on nerdy pollster email chains, but I did see the Vice News piece about the African American vote in Alabama, and it was not encouraging for those of us that would like Doug Jones to win. Uh, they feel disenfranchised and ignored, basically, which is, mm-hmm. a, I think, a justified reaction. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and perhaps, you know, perhaps there will be downstream lessons from this uh, for Democrats. I, I hope that there are. I think I would hope that the election of Trump taught us something about taking the African-American vote for granted. But uh, it you know, at least in this particular case, doesn't seem to have. I will ask you this, which is this, you know, the conservative movement with the pedophile bear as a symbol. You, your expert analysis on this, is there a place to go that's lower? Because I don't well, I even want to think I, about I, it. But cannibalism? It feels, <laughs> that you guy know, who <laughs> ate a face in Florida for a president. Right. I mean, we are really at the point where it's like, you know, public infanticide, uh, mm. cannibalism, uh, I don't know, some, you know, some sort of scatological horror show. I, we are just at the point now where, where the Republican Party, in a meaningful way, because it is, you know, run by Donald Trump, has commanded its resources to, to devote themselves to electing a pedophile mm. to the U.S. Senate, a kid diddler. This is a creepy stalker. This is the kind of guy that if you found him doing what he would, what he did with these teenage girls as a dad, you, know, you don't you don't you don't reach for your for your mouse to to fire up a uh, to fire up a, a, a snarky tweet. You reach for a shotgun, mm. and this is the kind of guy who who would be in prison in many many places if he was caught doing what he did. And 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 the party of Lincoln is now defending and actively aggressively advocating for a guy who is a pedophile. And I don't know how you get much lower than that. I really don't. And, you know, Moynihan used to say that, we're, you know, defining defining decency down mm-hmm. um, or deviancy down, we've, we've, defined, we've defined the Republican Party way, way, way down. You know, we, we've elected a guy who's, who's an authoritarian status. He's not a conservative. We've elected a guy who, you know, governs by rage tweet. And now we're going to elect a guy who you wouldn't let near five within five hundred feet of a high school, if you had any sense, and yeah. it's it's really a remarkable point, you know. And I've 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 managed to go through my career and my life as a very loyal guy to my party and my movement. But if I were in Alabama, there wouldn't even be a millisecond of hesitation that I would vote for Doug Jones. Not even a millisecond. I don't agree with him on a whole bunch of a whole spectrum of issues, but. Um, Doug Jones never took little girls to his house in the woods and undressed them. And Doug Jones never expressed interest in having sex with girls who were in their mid-teens. He never called someone out of pre-calculus to ask him on a date. Right. I mean, and, yeah. and, and, you know, look, if if that's the standard now, if nothing matters in the party whatsoever except the, the R after the guy's name, then, you know, this is a party with a death wish. And this is a party with with a desire um, to to you know isolate itself off from the rest of society, and unfortunately, parties that are operating in that narrow narrow bandwidth end up losing races and end up losing elections. And you know, if the Democrats are smart and stick to this sort of new principled position on on harassers, you know, they'll be able to put Doug Jones around the neck of the Republicans for a very long time. And look, I've talked to some folks in the Senate. Mean more and more last... around the neck of the Republicans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I've I've um, I've talked to some folks on the Senate side in the last few days who are utterly mortified that Trump demanded the RNC go back in. They tried to lobby. They tried to push back on it. And uh, you know, this is a party now that has a gun named Steve Bannon to its head. And, you know, they're desperately afraid of the Breitbart Fox uh, axis of assholes that are going to come after them if they dare to say anything um, critical of Roy Moore or Donald Trump. And, you know, they're they're in a tough position. I mean, McConnell's been pretty blunt about it in the last few days, but it's a tough position to be in right now. It's a really it's a really grim spot to be in as a as a as a U.S. senator, particularly um, 
where they don't all live in deep, deep red states. They don't all live in places, you know, where where uh, where a guy like Roy Moore would still be walking around without an ankle bracelet on. <laughs> you know, I I I, I want to talk to you about two two things that you brought up. The first, I haven't really heard anyone get into, and I'm hoping you have insight, which is that let's say Roy Moore Roy Moore wins. What does that actually look like in the Senate? I mean, I'm fearful that it looks like everyday business. Yeah, here's what I think happens. But go ahead. Um, If Roy Moore wins next Tuesday, he goes to the Senate. He immediately um, comes under an ethics investigation that drags out for a year. That goes on and on and on. It becomes a grinding shit show. He said, she said. Uh, Fox and Breitbart and Limbaugh and all the rest of the constellation of new and and existing uh, right wing media guys um, spend a year trying to burn these women down, um, and then Roy Moore does nothing uh, in the Senate but talk about judges, talk about Supreme Court justices, and we've got to keep him around for that one special vote that's going to come down the line when you know Ruth Bader Ginsburg you know drops dead of a heart attack or what have you. They're going to make that their excuse. They're going to say, oh, it's just about the judges. It's just about the Supreme Court. And if we don't have this one critical vote, we'll lose everything. You know, and 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 uh, he'll have this wall of defense from Breitbart and Bannon and those guys. And what will happen is the leadership will not do what they're what they should do. What they should do is refuse to seat him. Remember, the, they still have to vote to seat him in the Senate. Right. It's procedural. And regardless of what the people of Alabama, you know, think about Roy Moore, we are still a nation of of laws in the Constitution. And the Senate has the right under the Constitution to establish its criteria for seating people. You could say no. They could say no. The first day they could say, nope, not voting for this guy. You only need 11 Republicans. Yeah. And, you know, I think you've probably got five or six. But if you if you didn't seat him, yeah, yes, the people of Alabama would be in a rip-roaring fury. And it would feel bad and people would be mad about it. People would be pissed off about it. But at some point— you know, the institution has to protect the, 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 its constitutional role as a co-equal branch of government and and stand up and say, you know, look, we have we have some criteria here. And one of them is we don't put child molesters into into our uh, into this body. Right. The other thing McConnell could do if if Moore is, is elected and they choose not to blow him out the first day is to simply decline to seat him on any committees. Mm hmm. Yeah. Just just starve the guy out. Don't give him a venue. Don't give him a platform. Don't give him a place to go and be, um, you know, a, a monkey in the in the in the primate house who throws shit everywhere. You know, that would be something I think that they could do very easily. And the other thing is, you know, it, as as this grinds on, uh, this this wave of sexual harassment stories grinds on in the country. You know, the stories of these women uh, that have that have accused Roy Moore of this. They're going to come, you know, the, the research on those folks is not going to produce the smoking gun. If it was going to produce this like, oh, there's a conspiracy by George Soros and the evil left-wing empire. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and they all went back in the never Trump time machine and convinced these girls to seduce Roy Moore, those hussies. You know, it, when that doesn't ever come to pass and it won't, um, you know, Moore will be seen as what he is. He's a pedophile. Right. So Parachute mainly advertises their sheets and their sheets are fantastic. Uh, I have parachute sheets on my bed at home at this very moment, and they're lovely. They're they're, uh, linen, which I have talked about the benefits of having linen sheets before. Uh, You know, for one, they're just super comfortable against your skin. For two, they get better with time. For three, uh, you cannot have them be perfect, which is helpful to a perfectionist like myself when I make the bed. Um, if it was possible for the bed to be fully, perfectly made, I would never leave the house. Instead, I get to have a linen duvet cover, and it it just looks like linen duvet. But enough about the sheets. What I want to talk to you about is their towels. Their towels are amazing. For one thing, they're enormous. Uh, they are, I believe, called bath sheets, and they are almost the size of like a twin sheet. And they are magically absorbent. I, I They're really soft and dense. Uh, And they almost, this is going to sound really weird, but like almost like suck the water off of you. And I cannot tell you how wonderful it is in this winter in the Midwest 
to get out of a hot shower and wrap yourself completely in this warm, dense, enormous towel. It is so comforting. I love long hot showers and worst thing about them is getting out and these parachute towels kind of kind of you know put an end to that. If you want any of these things, parachute towels, parachute uh, sheets, they also I have they have blankets and pillows and robes. Uh, visit parachutehome.com slash friends and you will get free shipping and returns. And also if you do return it, they give their returns to Habitat for Humanity. So I don't think you'll return it, but no, if you do, that's okay. And again, for free shipping and those returns that you probably won't use, go to parachutehome.com slash friends, and you'll get a 60-night trial. If you don't love it, send it back. Parachutehome.com slash friends. I actually, yeah, I think there's some forking paths here, obviously, but one of those paths is that more women come forward. He wins, and that does something to the con. I don't want to say the conscience of these women, but um, it gives them uh, a reason to come forward. They maybe mm-hmm. right now are thinking, "Oh, he's not going to win, so I don't have to go out there and and bear my soul and and suffer from you know the avalanche of like criticism and shaming that always comes from doing that." Right, and especially because there's a weaponized process right, right now with Breitbart and Fox to turn right. these women to use the classic and evil defense. Oh, she's either a nut or a slut. She's mm-hmm. telling, she's not telling the truth. I've never met her, and if I did, she wanted it. Right. You know, that sort of thing. And and you know, as as the heat of the campaign goes away, those stories become um, you know more tangible, and pushing back on them from this whole Breitbart machine becomes less of a viable thing. They're not, they're not the top of mind for Breitbart's, you know, right. outrage of the day situation. And I look, I, I think the ethics committee deserves, uh, you know, if, if he is seated, they ought to go in immediately and, and, and start the process because there will be a complaint filed on the day he is seated. If they seat him, I don't know. I, I, uh, you know, if Mitch McConnell and, and Corey Gardner, you know, they, they've been extraordinarily clear the last few days. And I, 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 I think there's something that people haven't quite figured out yet. You know, dirty little secret of why isn't Mitch McConnell, you know, nuking this guy into the ground every day? Well, he did his best on the, all the things that you could do from the committee. But McConnell also recognizes that if he comes out right now and says, you know, don't, don't elect Roy Moore. He's an evil pedophile bastard, which I believe is what Mitch McConnell believes. All he does in that case is give Steve Bannon and Fox right. a – campaign lever to assist Roy Moore in his victory. Mm-hmm. If, he, if McConnell went out front and center on this stuff, they would be out there saying, the establishment rhino liberal Mitch McConnell wants to destroy our conservative champion Roy Moore. Yeah. It makes sense he's not doing it. So the other, you know, forking branch I wanted to ask you about is something you've alluded to that's like the one uh, piece of, of hope or optimism you can find in this sordid story, which is the idea that the Republican Party is, um, you know, setting a trap for itself by doing this. With the past year in mind, it's hard to believe that that is the case. Like, it seems like, you know, uh, Donald Trump is the horror movie villain that will never die. And he, <sighs> and he's and he's supporting the Republican Party. But you really believe that the are you going to make a distinction here? I guess between the party and the president. Um, do you really think that the Republican Party is is dooming itself on, to like twenty eighteen losses? Well, look, this? I mean, the Senate map for Democrats in twenty eighteen is still terrible. Yeah. Okay, it's just awful. Right. Republicans have eight seats up in eighteen. They are not particularly uh, highly vulnerable seats. Um. So the map in twenty eighteen for the Democrats wasn't great to begin with. But we are going to see, I think, in the House, a much bigger impact because mm-hmm. there are about 30 seats in the House that are in suburban districts that are in, you know, the the exurb suburb metros of Northern Virginia and Philadelphia and parts of and, and, and you know parts of Florida, even parts of Texas. You know, these these less hard right seats are going to be up. Many of them are in places that Hillary Clinton won and Barack Obama won. And, and, and many of them are driven by the votes of professional and educated women. And I think that, you know, 
call me crazy, and I, I just been to this political thing for only 30 years or so, so I might be over my skis here. But last time I checked, women hate child molesters. It's just, a, it's like a, it's a thing I've heard about. Um, and you know I what? Feeling, I would hope that men hate them too, but yes. One, one would hope, yes. yes. One would hope. Yes. But obviously the president doesn't. Yeah. And, and, and obviously Steve Bannon doesn't. These guys are perfectly right. good with a pedophile, mm. with a guy who wanted sex with teenage girls when he was in his 30s. I mean, it... it this this redefinition of the Republican Party as we're going to win no matter what we're going to take um, we're going to take you know whatever whatever pulls up behind the sewage barge of Steve Bannon's party and drag it onto the deck and say it's the, the greatest Republican since prepared mustard. Mm. Um, it, I think it's just a terrible um, a, a terrible outcome, and and I do think there's a certain among Republicans who who have a shred of decency left, and there are quite a few. Um, you know, who have spoken out publicly about more, and many in the Senate, frankly, um, they've looked at this and just said, you know, it's like your question: how much, how much deeper can we sink? How much further down do we go? How 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 much are we going to let this guy drag us under? Um, but you know, moral courage is the shortest, the thing in shortest supply in Washington D.C., and it always has been. Mm. Yeah, and and speaking of that, uh, one twist, one more twist on the Franken story, which is that I, you know, came out um, suggesting he resign, and I again s- still believe that that was the right thing to do. And a lot of the immediate pushback I get from my fellow liberals is, you know, there's a version of he'll let he'll he'll resign when Trump does, mm-hmm. uh, and then. Uh, well, if you want Franken to pay or if you want Franken to have consequences, how come these other senators aren't calling for Trump to have consequences for his, you know, alleged sexual assaults? And I guess that brings to mind, like, do you think that there it is a lack of moral courage or it is smart politics for Democrats to not talk about the sexual assaults that Trump is alleged to have committed? Like, you could talk about that. Like, that is a thing that Democrats could do. I mean, I think about it almost every fucking day. Sure. Sure. So, I mean, look, uh, I mean, and I don't want to get, go down the rat hole here, right. but, you know, Donald Trump's pattern of behavior over time that is explicable and, and recorded and acknowledged um, and, and it, from, the, from, the, from the least consequential, and I'm, I'm saying this very advisedly, from the least consequential of the, the smack talking, you know, grab her by the pussy talk like that. To the most consequential, which are women who've accused him of of assault mm-hmm. and folks who've who have brought up his connections to noted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein, um, you know, from the from the from the spectrum of bad behavior on Trump's part, it's enormous. Yeah. It is also right now sort of baked in the cake. You know, it's not gonna move Republican men or the less educated away from Trump. It may move uh, Republican women away from Trump, but they were already doing a pretty good job of that on their own. And and I think it almost distracts because it almost puts it back on the celebrity aspect right. of Trump, and almost puts it back on that on that you know he's a he's a he's a TV star, he's a character, he's a wild man. And, and I think if Democrats are strategically smart, what do they what are, how do you how do you dismantle Donald Trump? You know, short of short of you know him eating himself into a grave of filet of fish, <laughs> he dismantled Donald Trump by eliminating his power to do anything in Washington. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think it you know it just it is it is painful, like almost literally painful to think that he won't have reckoning on this specific set of charges. Uh, yeah, I, I think you understand, but it it and I've no, I agree completely. It. I, I, it is. He is a man. He is a man that has deserved a reckoning on so many fronts for so long, and and I and I you know and karma is a magnificent bitch, mm. but she has not yet decided today is the day, yeah. and and I, I I I wonder if I wonder if the tribalism of the Republican Party um, has become so powerful that that you know the day that it all collapses as 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 evil always does. The day that it all collapses, the day that it all goes downhill fast, 
Um, you know, I know a lot of these guys are going to try to quickly rewrite history. Oh, I always hated Donald Trump. He was always, oh, oh, oh. Um, but I don't think you get away from this one. I don't think you wash the stain off. If you've, if you've been a guy who's even sat silent or even said things like, well, the people of Alabama will decide about, you know, pedophile, pedophile. And there is no culture on this earth that's cool with that. And, <laughs> and you know, the fact that the fact that Donald Trump has forced the what what his at least his faction of the Republican Party to become cheerleaders for this guy, it's 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 amazingly repulsive. And hopefully they'll be held to pay. I hope so. Well, Rick, uh, thank you for stopping by. Uh, get some rest please i shall uh and we need we need you <laughs> we need you in better fighting form uh you know cuz uh i was actually just talking to steve schmidt today about how we do need to work together like this is going to have to happen right like yep. th- it's not just a marriage of rhetoric I think no, that, it, you know, when we started having these conversations, I guess now, gosh, probably six or seven months ago. Yeah. I don't know. I can't, I don't know. It, you know, we were kind of feeling our way towards what are, what are we going to do as, as not just as, as partisans, but as Americans to, to manage this thing and to try to mitigate it and try to come out of it on the other side with something that isn't, you know, Mad Max radioactive hellscape. And, you know, I, I think that urgency of that need is growing uh, really rapidly, I think it. I think that this race in Alabama has catalyzed that, and I think the fact that you know Alabama is only a preview for mm-hmm. the kind of trash human beings that Steve Bannon is going to try to put into this process and and use as as Trump's sort of army to 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 degrade our politics and our culture and our country to a point where none of us will recognize it. I am hopeful that. You know, progressives and conservatives and Democrats and Republicans will be able to work together to address this existential crisis and this crisis of courage. Um, As I told Steve, and I will share with you, I look forward to arguing about marginal tax rates with you guys. God bless, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be great. (laughs) You're totally wrong about carried interest, (laughs) Anna. Oh, I, 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 I'm the state tax, you know, all that, that is also, obviously those are things in the news, but that's not what we need to be arguing about right now, unfortunately. Um, anyway, well, we will also argue about that. Maybe I'll put it that way. We will also argue about that. Thank you for, for coming on and, um, we'll check in with you again, hopefully. You bet. Well, that's it for the show. Thank you for being a super fan who makes it all the way to the end of the show. Uh, if you are listening to this, Uh, please go to iTunes and rate and review us. It helps other people find the show uh, and it makes the ratings uh, look a little more shiny, which is nice in these dark times. Take care of yourselves. We'll be back next week. 